Good evening, everyone. My name is Engin Eisen. I'm a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London uh, in politics and international relations uh, school. And it's um, a delight to uh, introduce you to our speakers uh, this evening and to welcome you to University of London Institute in Paris, where we also offer, um, as Queen Mary School of Politics and International Relations, programs in uh, international politics and international relations. Um, we have really a fabulous two speakers uh, this evening who are going to talk about really something very significant. And despite enormous amount of debate that's taking place about mm -hmm. the impact of Brexit on the European Union, there is very little really consideration about the possible consequences of post-Brexit European Union on the relationship between the UK and France. And the UK-France relationship actually goes well beyond and earlier than um, the European Union. We could go to 1347, possibly, as Virginie is going to do, briefly. But we could also remember in 1940, we were just talking about that a minute ago, 1940, uh, just after France fell, there was a declaration of um, France, uh, UK, or France, Great Britain Union as one country. That was in 1940, and it was in the possibility of imagine, imaginative uh, possibility at that time. And ever since the relationship goes through in different uh, stages, but we're going to hear from Tim Bell, who is also a colleague um, with me at the um, Queen Mary. He's a professor of British politics, but also uh, he's done uh, incredible work on both parties and the relationship between politics and policy. And our second speaker is Virginie uh, Gourdon, and who is a professor in uh, Sciences Po, and she has done also incredible work on political sociology of the European Union, as well as the contradictions and paradoxes of immigration policy. So how we are going to do it is, is Tim is going to start, um, I think, 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And we are going to immediately switch over to Virginie. And she's going to do the same 20, 25 minutes. In between, I might have some questions to just warm us up, or I might just gauge how you're doing and then immediately jump into question and answer after that. Without further ado, Tim. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Engin. So, uh, the day after Brexit, um, French politicians started casting doubt on uh, the uh, system of juxtaposed controls that exist uh, between France and the UK. If you're not quite sure what juxtaposed controls are, uh, briefly we're talking about the fact that um, when you arrive uh, on the Eurostar uh, in Paris, you have already entered uh, French territory before you even went through the tunnel effectively, because the border control for France uh, is uh, done, is exercised at St Pancras International Railway Station. Uh, we're also talking about, um, on the other side of things, on the seafaring side of things, if you cross from uh, Calais to Dover on the ferry, uh, the border control for the UK takes place uh, in Calais rather than in Dover. And as I said, a technical name for that is juxtaposed controls. The day after Brexit, in fact hours after uh, Brexit, um, some French politicians were casting doubt on whether uh, that uh, relationship could um, continue. One uh, French uh, politician, a, a local uh, politician, or should I say a regional uh, politician, uh, Xavier Bertrand, I think it, uh, his name is, who's the president of de France, uh, region uh, tweeted, and I'll, I'll translate uh, rather than try my French accent out on you. Um, the uh, English uh, want to uh, reclaim their liberty, 
um, so they must reclaim their frontier. Uh, hashtag Brexit, hashtag Calais. Uh, he also uh, said, uh, and uh, forgive me, I have to quote it, he said, the British people have decided, so I asked the French government to renegotiate the Lutuque Accord. And the Lutuque Accord, and I think Virginie will go into it in a little bit more detail, mm -hmm. is what sets up these juxtaposed controls between uh, Dover uh, and Calais. And he was supported by the mayor of Calais uh, yeah. at the time, Natasha uh, Bouchard, is it um, pronounced? Uh, yeah, and, and she said, uh, the border needs to return to England. The British wanted to leave the EU. They have to accept all the economic and migratory consequences. Uh, and Francois Fillon, remember him? Uh, he said on the 26th um, of, uh, of June, the accord is broken, so we need to examine Le Touquet, of course. Okay, so you have a rush of uh, French politicians who are uh, suggesting uh, that uh, uh, these juxtaposed controls needed rethinking in the light of Brexit, and that seemed to confirm something that David Cameron had warned about in February 2016, and there was a few months before the EU referendum, or rather his spokesman warned about it. Uh, he said that there was a risk of France tearing up the treaty uh, keeping migrants in Calais if we quit the EU. And his spokesman went further, and here I'm quoting, saying, you would move the camp, in other words, the jungle, as it's called, and the people in it, overnight to the southeast of England. A potential departure from the EU would throw the whole relationship with France into question. There could literally be thousands of people coming to the UK to claim asylum at Folkestone or other entry points on the south coast. So some quite sort of apocalyptic warnings from um, the uh, British side before the EU referendum of what leaving might mean for the relationship uh, um, between France and Britain when it came to migration, seemingly confirmed by some of the, the tweets and the public statements of French politicians just after we actually made the decision to leave the EU. So uh, what I thought I'd say a little bit about, and I think Virginie will tackle this as well, is, is, is that actually likely? Uh, are these things going to come um, to pass? Because I'm not um, telling you a detective story, I don't have to leave the, uh, the answer to the end, I'll, I'll say it straight away, I doubt it. Uh, and I'm going to try and say why that might be the case, and Virginie I think will also have a take uh, on this. I also want to say something at the end anyway about what that tells us um, about um, uh, how even in this very populist era, uh, interests and you might say a kind of rational perception of what a state's interests are can trump um, the politics of uh, uh, electoral uh, prejudice and uh, emotions. So. Um, these juxtaposed controls, as I think um, uh, Virginie will, will tell you a little bit more about, began uh, particularly when it comes to um, the, uh, the Dover-Calais situation in, in the early 2000s. Um, and as I say, it, it's really about the UK frontier uh, beginning in Calais and the French border beginning uh, in Kent. Um, it uh, offers certainly advantages uh, to the UK, and it also offers some advantages uh, to France. Uh, what is it designed to do? It is essentially designed uh, to uh, put off uh, asylum uh, seekers, in particular illegal migrants, from trying to make it uh, to uh, the island of Great Britain. Okay, because. Uh, they actually have to pass through border controls in France and therefore uh, there is no point in them actually uh, uh, trying to go direct uh, to, to Britain. Um, so uh, that is also obviously the case the other way round. Um, should there be asylum seekers in Britain wishing to claim asylum in France, uh, then theoretically uh, that would be uh, the same for them. But as your laughter indicates, you realise that actually uh, most of this traffic, in fact, virtually I would say all of this traffic, is, is one way. 
Okay, the, the, the situation really is to prevent people getting uh, to the UK rather than to prevent people from the UK uh, getting to uh, France. So the purpose really is to deter. And there has been some success, I think, in uh, that respect. If you look uh, at the, the raw numbers, uh, you will see that there were 80,000 claims in 2003, which reduced to 30,000 claims uh, by 2016. Now clearly that's not all down to the Lutuke Agreement or to the agreement that preceded that, um, which allows Eurostar uh, to do the same thing and, and have those juxtaposed controls. Um, but uh, it probably has something at least to do with those juxtaposed controls. What it doesn't do, however, what it hasn't done, is to stop people trying um, to make it to the UK by um, evading those border controls in France. Um, and the, the number of people trying to do that and, and being detected um, doing that is going up um, every month, or at least has gone up. Uh, until the last month that I'm aware of we have figures for and we only have figures because the Economist magazine uh, issued a freedom of information request to the UK government and the figures came out that way. Between 2008 and 2012 there were about 1,000 people per calendar month tried uh, to make that, uh, that journey uh, across the, the border in France into the UK. Um, in 2013 it was 2,000 per calendar month, in 2014 it was 4,000 per calendar month, and in uh, July of 2015 it was 13,000 in that month. So uh, what it hasn't done is necessarily deter people uh, uh, making the attempt, but what it has done is cut down the number of people who succeed uh, in, in that attempt, you can argue. Uh, at least in terms of succeeding in getting to the island of uh, Great Britain. But you see the evidence of, of the, uh, the distinction between those two figures in a camp like the jungle, which um, gained uh, media notoriety, of course, not just in the UK, but in particular in France and indeed all over the world. This is a kind of uh, a world story. Um, the problem, I think, for Great Britain is that were those people uh, to make it to the UK, they would in fact have a pretty good claim uh, for asylum. Now, of course, the UK can argue, as it does, and it's in some ways is the basis of the controls, that these people should be claiming asylum in, in France or in the first country they entered the, the EU in. Um, but if they were to claim asylum in, in, in Britain, because they come from war-torn parts of the world, many of them from Syria, uh, but also from Afghanistan, from uh, Iraq, uh, other places in, in the Middle East, uh, they would have a pretty good um, claim, and of course some parts of uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So, there has been um, concern obviously in France about the jungle, and that has led uh, politicians in France, and particularly opposition polit uh, politicians in France, to claim that something <coughs> must be done, uh, as we say uh, in, in English. Um, I'm not sure what the French equivalent is, il faut faire quelque chose, I don't know if you'd say it like that, but certainly something must be done in England is a very uh, common cry uh, from politicians, particularly um, opposition um, politicians. And, and there was one uh, politician who in fact was in government at the time, uh, who in, in uh, 2016, uh, the economy minister of France uh, told the FT um, that uh, Brexit would see London's financial services employees looking to relocate to France, so that was a good thing, and it would also see the French authorities uh, uh, looking to do something about uh, juxtaposed controls. Um, uh, the, uh, the point he made was the day that this relationship unravels, in other words, if Britain were to vote for Brexit, migrants will no longer be in Calais. Um, and uh, he made it very clear that he thought, you know, that um, uh, the uh, whole uh, migration relationship between the two countries would have to be uh, rethought at that point. And of course, that young economy minister uh, was none other than Emmanuel Macron. Uh, you have, however, other uh, French politicians saying uh, the same thing. 
or their spokesman. So the spokesman for, uh, for uh, Anna Juppé said in November 2016, so that's uh, after Brexit, uh, he's, uh, he said, uh, speaking to the BBC, uh, it's a consequence of Brexit, it's not a punishment. When it comes to border management, you can't make as if nothing has happened. Uh, and we all know that the vote for Brexit was mainly expressed because of migration. So it has an impact and we cannot continue like this. I cannot imagine a French president and a French president telling people, well, you know, the Brits have decided to leave, but we have to enforce the border at our border. This would be very hard to explain, he said. Uh, and he's not uh, alone by, by any stretch of the imagination. But Emmanuel Macron, of course, was back um, campaigning in uh, 2017 and he said uh, again there uh, during his uh, presidential campaign that I want to put the Lutoke uh, border deal on the table it must be renegotiated which got a lot of headlines uh, in the UK I don't know how many headlines it got in France but it certainly got people in the UK uh, very uh, concerned French government politicians, however, and Emmanuel Macron uh, accepted, uh, have been rather less keen uh, to give the impression that Le Touquet would be uh, revised. Uh, when uh, the, the French politicians who I've already quoted started tweeting and making public statements about the need to uh, do something about Le Touquet and, and about the jungle, the interior minister, Cazeneuve, uh, was reported as telling the cabinet that Brexit won't change anything, uh, that we will still uh, go ahead with um, the juxtaposed controls we've always had. Hollande uh, himself, remember him, uh, issued uh, a statement to that uh, effect as well. Uh, and uh, even more recently, the Interior uh, Minister in June 2017 um, made it clear that to return the border to England would be complex, uh, to quote him, it would block the functioning of the tunnel, but, he said, however, we will have to find more favourable conditions regarding responsibility for a certain number of costs in France. Uh, we need extra security measures in Calais for the port, the railways and the motorways. So in other words, what he was saying was, well, no, we'll keep these juxtaposed controls, but the UK needs to start stumping up a little bit more cash in order to help us uh, maintain them. And indeed, the, the UK has already stumped up millions of pounds uh, every year to build some of the, the fences and the security uh, measures uh, that you see around uh, the port and will presumably uh, continue uh, to do so. All this has been very much a relief, I think, to uh, Theresa May and, and her government. Uh, she was, I think, quite concerned about uh, the possibility that Macron meant what he said before he was elected and that Le Touquet would be revisited. Um, straight after his election, <coughs> she said uh, that Le Touquet works for the benefit of both the UK and France, and obviously, um, this was during the course of the British election campaign, uh, which she thought she would win convincingly, obviously, at that stage. Uh, if the government that is elected after the 8th of June, we will be sitting down and talking to Monsieur Macron and others about how that system has worked, both to the benefit of France as well as for the benefit of the UK. So she was determined to, to sit uh, Emmanuel Macron down and, and tell him that uh, it was good for France as well as good for Britain. Now, what are these benefits to France? I think Virginie will, will talk a little bit more about this as well. What are the benefits um, of, of the Lutokia uh, agreement? Uh, and of course the agreement that pertains to Eurostar as well. Well, I, I think for France, um, although it may not be immediately obvious, by making it harder to reach the UK, uh, by extending the UK's border into France, it is probably the case that that means that fewer people will in the end come to France thinking that they can uh, use France as a jumping off point to get to the UK. I think were the border to be moved back to Dover you would have even more people coming to uh, northern France in order to try and make that 
trip. Uh, and if you know you thought the jungle was bad or Songat was bad, then I think it will be nothing um, as compared to what you might get um, if people thought that they could um, collect themselves on the French coast and then get uh, to the UK somehow. We also have to ask ourselves how they would attempt to get to the UK. We might have a situation um, in which actually as um, none other than Marine Le Pen, who was taking a surprisingly humanitarian view uh, of, the, of the issue, uh, told Nigel Farage, who currently is a radio show host in the UK, uh, she said, um, more and more deaths would occur on the shore of our countries and on the shores of Britain. Uh, it would involve changing Calais into Lampedusa uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Italy. Uh, so in other words, she is, is putting forward the idea that you know, we will turn the, the channel into what we've seen in the, in the Mediterranean, people going over uh, in, in boats trying to make it into the UK. Now, um, for the, the UK, uh, I think it is, it is uh, also true to say that all this applies and some. If we were to move the, um, the border back uh, to Dover, it would uh, massively increase the amount of um, border uh, control infrastructure that the UK government would have to construct after Brexit. There's already a great deal of concern that if we crash out of the EU, we will have to do something about customs and we will have to tarmac over part of Kent in order to be able to cope with all the lorries that would get stuck. Um, the UK government is coming under severe pressure from interests in the freight um, uh, haulage industry and industry more generally not to do anything that will further delay uh, lorries going through to and from France. Um, if we were to have to move the border back, um, the delays to uh, freight would probably be immense because all the searching that would have to be done would have to be done uh, in, in the UK and it's something that um, industry is incredibly uh, worried uh, about. The other reason I suspect that actually um, Brexit or no Brexit, we won't see a, a change in these juxtaposed controls despite the fact that um, French politicians have floated those, those changes is that um, the UK-French relationship, as Engin has already suggested, goes way beyond this. Uh, the bilateral relationship between the UK and, and France involves all sorts of other areas, and in particular <coughs> foreign policy and defence. We have all sorts of interests which EU or no are actually very uh, related. In other words, the, the cooperation on migration is not the only aspect of the bilateral relationship between the UK and France. Uh, therefore, it strikes me as unlikely that either country would want to do something that might disrupt that wider bilateral relationship, which will continue uh, irrespective of Brexit, simply because it is driven by interests that we have in other parts uh, of uh, the world and interests that we have in projecting uh, our power as middle-ranking states who also uh, have a seat on, on the Security Council. So I think there are various reasons, both to do with uh, the interests of the UK and France in the migration field, backed up by pressure, uh, certainly in, in the UK from, um, from industry, uh, but also, as I say, because of the wider bilateral relationship, which means that the um, uh, Touque and uh, the, the arrangements for the Eurostar will, will still uh, say the same. Now, it's important to realise that um, there isn't necessarily any institutional reason why the Tuca has to continue. If you look at that, um, that treaty, it can be unilaterally abrogated uh, with two years notice. So in other words, if France wanted to do it, France could do it, uh, and they could just give notice to the UK and say, you know, this is ending in two years time, start building some border control facilities in Dover, uh, because uh, you know you haven't got you've only got 24 months to do so, uh, for example. And what's also interesting is that French um, public opinion, as much as we can measure it, um, probably agrees with some of the French politicians uh, who um, have tweeted and made public statements on this matter. Um, there was some uh, polling done on this by YouGov, 
uh, in March 2016 of both British and French uh, respondents. And when they asked both British and French respondents, half of the British respondents uh, wanted the UK board to stay in Calais, uh, and only a fifth of them wanted it to move back to Dover. Uh, the French respondents were the mirror image of the British uh, respondents. 20% of French people who were questioned on this said the UK border should stay in Calais, but 51% of them thought that it should move back uh, to Dover. Now, I would say that if 51% of um, French people were, were telling uh, opinion pollsters at that time that they'd like to see it move back to Dover, with a, a, a campaign, and a very emotive campaign, French politicians could probably raise that to 60%, even 70%, uh, if, they, if they so choose. But I don't think they will choose to do that, uh, for the reasons I have uh, already given. I think that French politicians, particularly <coughs> French politicians in government, and it's very noticeable that Macron has not returned yet anyway to the idea of renegotiating <coughs> uh, Lutuque, will uh, maintain juxtaposed controls, Brexit or no Brexit. Okay. Thanks very much, Tim. I think that's really an, um, a great opening to our discussion. It plays out uh, arguments against for, but at the same time, we know what Tim thinks will happen or likely happen. Virginia. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Tim. Um, actually, completely in agreement oh, with no. your prediction. <laughs> um, nothing will happen. Is it well? Uh, nothing is likely to happen in the sense that it is unlikely, uh, given what we've seen after the election of Emmanuel Macron, um, and uh, in fact, after the declarations of its Home Secretary, Ministre de l'Intérieur, Gérard Collomb, who did go to Calais, uh, it is unlikely that they will somehow contest the Touquet agreement, or as you say, just uh, really naturally say, <laughs> you know, we, we get out of the agreement. Um, and, uh, but that makes it indeed an interesting question. Um, now, Tim uh, suggested that when you're running for an election, and you're in an electoral campaign, you say, yes, you know, the British should control their borders, and you know, if now you have voted for Brexit, uh, we get out of the 2K, you, to, you, know, you take care of your own borders. The 100 years war is over. <laughs> It's not 1347 when the bourgeois of Calais uh, were defeated by the English. You know, now you take care of your own borders. After all, Brexit was about sovereignty. You want sovereignty. You control your sovereign borders in your own country. That's when he was indeed campaigning that Emmanuel Macron said that. Uh, but once he was uh, elected president, uh, he nominated a particular and a home secretary, Gérard Collomb, who went to Calais uh, at a particular time when people were uh, harassed, people were there were harassed by the police. Uh, their blankets were gassed with tear gas. Uh, they were not, did not have access to water. Um, the administrative tri tribunal, um, and still the home secretary came and said there will be no other camp in Calais. So he said, you know, basically we're not going to do anything in Calais, but at the same time we're not, you know, we're not going to change anything in relationship to the UK. Um, so this, this having been said, um, what basically we have to understand is uh, policy inertia and even the policy consensus uh, on, in France. Um, Tim said, well, there has to be reasons why the French, <laughs> there has to be re reasons why the French are happy to be the border uh, uh, of the UK. Um, but I'm just going to give, you know, I'm going to go very quickly now, uh, first to recall how we, ha we came to that situation. Um, second, I'm going to go into uh, perhaps trying to be counterintuitive arguments to explain why France indeed is still uh, supporting uh, the uh, agreements, and then conclude about perhaps some uh, uh, maybe a larger conclusion on what he tells us about the EU post-Brexit, mm -hmm. beyond the French-UK uh, relationship. 
Um, so how did we get there? Um, before, just one more preliminary remark. We are focusing on Calais, Sangat, a very small, um, it's a very small towns, I would say. Um, of course, as you know, there are also people in uh, Paris near the Gare du Nord uh, who are also trying to get to England. Mm -hmm. There are also there are also border controls in Paris, just as there are in Brussels. Uh, but it's still a very small uh, part of, uh, of course, of asylum seeking and migration into the UK or into Europe. So actually, I'm not talking about. When we're talking about this, we're not talking about migration, just to make it clear. Most people actually seeking asylum in the UK or arriving in the UK are still doing so by plane, <laughs> not going through the Euro tunnel. At the same time, it's given a lot of attention, of course, because of the situation, the fact that they are doing it, it's dangerous uh, and uh, people are dying, and because on the other, that would be the left-wing argument, if you want to and the right-wing argument is they are doing so irregularly, helped by uh, criminals, criminal networks, right? So this, it's a little bit of what we are calling now a new, the hot spot, okay? So we're focusing a lot of attention, but as usual, you know, if you lose your keys, you look <laughs> for your keys under the lamppost, because there's light, but probably you need to sort of see the bigger picture. So I'm not going to talk to you about migration into the EU or into the UK, but the fact that still that particular hotspot, of course, has been given a lot of attention by the media, of course, in the UK, um, but also in France, and has been given also a lot of attention, as was mentioned, during electoral campaigns. Uh, you're also aware of that actually the National Front is doing extremely well in all the France, and it's all now in northern France. Um, so that there's a lot of, uh, I would say, political and media attention uh, uh, to that particular case, which, as I said, does not mean that it's, you know, we could, we could focus on, on the bigger picture, we could focus on other cases in Europe where we do have the same situation. Uh, so that's, that's for the end of preliminaries. Um, so how did we get there? In, uh, what's interesting in this story is uh, we know that in 1996 the Eurotunnel opens. It's not, uh, of course, as if governments had not thought about this border issue before. Uh, at the same time, it's still not clear at the time that this, this will be such an issue that somehow people will actually get to Calais. But very quickly, it does. Why? Because already, think of 1996, we have the Schengen Agreement that has been signed in 1990 without the UK. But that still has the idea that there should be strong external borders of the EU and we should prevent people from arriving on the soil of, of Europe. The UK has its own legislation on visas and its own legislation on career sanctions. That's very important, by the way, because that means if you are a ferry or a truck driver or, of course, a train company and someone arrives on UK territory and someone without proper passport or visa, you are liable as a train company, as a ferry company, etc. The UK has its own <coughs> legislation on that, but at the same time, it is the same idea, the same spirit as all of the legislation on the continent. France also adopts Schengen visas, carrier sanctions. There is not a disagreement, if you will, between the UK and the continent on what needs to be done to prevent asylum seekers in particular and some undesirable migrants, which we can uh, detail, to arrive. So it's, there's not a disagreement. But, of course, the UK is out of Schengen. At the same time, the UK is one of the initiator and signatory of the Dublin Agreement, also in 1990, uh, which is great because it says that if anybody arrives in the UK but has transited to uh, another signatory of Dublin, so basically a mainland European uh, uh, country, they can be sent back to that first country where they landed. You know. The UK has the cake and eats it too. 
It's not in Schengen, but it's in Dublin. So it doesn't have to, you know, it, it keeps its own border, but can see, still send asylum seekers back. It even gets better because as uh, we go along, it still participates in what will become in the Maastricht Treaty, it's still called the third pillar. Third pillar. In 1993, when the Maastricht com comes into force, and in later treaties, the UK says, I'm opting out of this all cooperation on borders. But if I want to, I can actually sign on. Uh, so it's called a selective opt-in, which is a little bit different from the Danish case. All of this happened, and, can, and you keep saying, well, it's, it's a bit uh, too good to, to be true. But as I said, there is not really, at this point, uh, um, much resistance on the on uh, on the side of the French, for instance, uh, uh, on, uh, on that issue. When it becomes interesting is indeed that uh, in 1999 there is a second biggest wave of refugees after the fall of the Berlin Wall because of the war in Kosovo. We had asylum seekers arriving from in, in, in Europe, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, etc., plus Kosovo, and many of them, indeed, mostly Kosovars, go to Calais, but along with Afghans, etc. Uh, and that's when a Red Cross camp is set up in Sangat, actually, which is very near Calais, until 2002. So for three years, there is this Red Cross camp. Uh, and that's when the issue becomes political. On the French side, uh, it will be in 2002 when our future president, Sarkozy, pretending to be under pressure from Blanket, uh, will decide to close, uh, to close the camp. Uh, but what's interesting about the, 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 the camp is that it sets a precedent in the mind of the bureaucrats. If there is a camp, people will come. And there will be more people coming if you treat them decently. Now, I know it sounds, you know, if anybody has any kind of human rights uh, vocation in this room or humanitarian uh, <laughs> inclination, the, there is this precedent of Songhats. And it still is in the mind when you talk to Burke, you know, when I interview uh, people in policy, that it's still this idea. If we, it's just like if we say, we take away the border. Or we, 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 we set up a camp, then I heard in 2016 under Hollande a prefet, so uh, one of the head of the regional administration, saying if there is no longer Le Touquet, 700,000 people will come to Calais to go to England. So 700,000, that seems like a very kind of a, one of these strange numbers, meaning. Everybody's going to Germany, and all of a sudden, instead of going to Germany, they will go to England from France. Um, but that has, uh, I think it's something we have to keep in mind. It's somehow our bureaucrats, they already have this idea that um, uh, they are inheritors of, of, uh, of the past, and they always bring that as, a, as an issue. Uh, so that's uh, the, the, the second thing that's interesting about the Songat episode is that uh, why were people going to the UK? It's precisely because of the type of conflict and the type of people that were involved. Not everybody wants to go to the UK, actually. People are very happy to go to Germany or to go to Sweden and even some to France. <laughs> but, but it also, no, but it's true. Yeah, okay. but, it depends on the kind. It so happens that people from Afghanistan knew English. Uh, same thing for, you know, that's they had already come, no, communities there, family, <laughs> but it still gives the idea that you know, everybody wants to go to the UK. So that's also, in, in some sense, uh, so on the French side, they this idea that if we have a camp, people will come. And on the UK side, the idea that everybody wants to come to the UK. Well, in fact, if you look at earlier crises, people actually did go to Germany. They were, you know, for instance, from ex in Yugoslavia. So to, to some of this history, we have uh, somehow two things going on at the same time. We have the development of EU cooperation, where the UK, as I said, has basically the, an ideal uh, situation, which somehow Nigel Farage has you know, 
overlooked. Uh, um, and, and as Tim also uh, mentioned, we did, of course, the broader, the broader issue of EU cooperation uh, between France and Britain with respect to not look to get uh, some Malo and other agreements. Mm -hmm. um, and also this bureaucratic idea that somehow uh, it's, you know, the, the Calais border cannot be uh, has to stay in France, and at the same time, it cannot be somehow uh, be a humanitarian situation. This is now 2017. All of these things I'm talking about are in the 20th century. The Dublin, Schengen, the Sangat, all of this, imagine, 1999. <coughs> and some of you were not even born in this room, probably, or rarely. Um, and so there's a real policy <coughs> inertia here. There's no, not, you know, we had left-wing government, right-wing government, we had Sarkozy, Hollande, uh, different of, of, at the regional no, level. We had socialists, now Xavier Bertrand is from the right, mm -hmm. before there was someone from the socialist government. So we have to understand some, some, uh, what was going on. That means we have to look away from politics. It seems contradictory because I said it's, it's big, big in the media, big, but at mm -hmm. the same time, the people day to day are running both at the EU level, at the national level in the UK and France, and at the regional and local level, what's happening in Calais. They are, have their own agenda, if you will, and their own view of what's going on. If we start from the local level, uh, and I'm not talking about the mayor uh, in particular, but Calais is an important port. Eurostar is a huge company. There are, as you know, millions of people taking that train. There is also for Calais the issue of ferries and other uh, and transport. In their opinion, there has to be, they are ready to invest with some help from the UK, but mostly French money, but they are ready to invest in securitizing uh, Calais. Because they think that otherwise, people with business will go elsewhere in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in other French ports, in Cherbourg, in Rotterdam, etc. So for them, it's not a humanitarian issue, it's an economic issue. And it's actually the region in France now who is handling the ports, the local and regional issue, it's not the national government. They have done wonderful things, they've put edges, you know, for instance, they also have given money to humanitarian associations to give food to people behind nice, trees and hedges so people who are driving through or taking the train don't see that there are you know, uh, some asylum seekers or, or, or migrants trying to, to get there. There is that, that, uh, that point. At the more, uh, at the uh, national EU level, as I already mentioned, it, there is a mantra, there is a dogma that has not really evolved. Uh, which is still on this idea that, as I said, if you, know, if you have a camp, people will come there. In French, it's called appel d'air. Uh, so if we don't have that in English, it's like there's a sucking, mm. sucking pump. Maybe you could tell the daily mail, but that French concept. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of inertia at the EU level among governments that are not UK governments. In, in sense, in, what I mean by that is the way that the UK is behaving with France is the way France behaves with Italy, is the way that the founders of Schengen thought of Schengen as having always a cordon sanitaire or buffer zone south, east of, the, uh, of them so that people will not come. The notion of remote control is very old, by the way. It was invented by the United States in the early 20th century, uh, late 19th century. So the idea of juxtaposed control, the idea that you don't arrive in England and then have border controls, is the case, of course, for all Schengen countries. You impose visas on most of the countries of the world. The first border that you will cross will be at a consulate in the country of origin where you, you know, that's what you your first border control, way before you arrive. So in that sense, there is the contradiction I would say is you cannot say, oh, the UK has, you know, has put the border in Calais and, and they are not bearing the cost, while you're actually doing exactly the same thing 
as a philosophy, I would say, uh, meaning as a policy paradigm, if you want to use a, a social scientific term. Uh, you've been doing that ever since Schengen was signed in 1990, with the same principle. People first have, you know, we don't want asylum seekers to arrive and say, I claim asylum. They have to get a visa and a passport. And of course, if you're an asylum seeker, by definition, you're not going to be anywhere near a consulate, or you may not have a passport. Uh, but that philosophy has been the same <laughs> ever since the early 90s, which puts France in an odd situation. How can they say one thing about the UK? Well, in La Roya Valley, in Vintimiglia, in Vintimiglia you have camps just as in Calais, but they are in Italy for people trying to get to France. Um, I've been too no, but I just want to finish with Trump. <laughs> Uh, people make fun of Trump. You see, you're laughing already. I just said Trump. Yeah. People laugh. Yeah. Uh, I still want to know your, your opinion on that in the discussion, because when Trump said, we're going to build a wall and the Mexicans will pay for it, everybody laughed. One of the reasons I laughed is nobody's going across the border anymore, actually. Most of the we know that 61% of the people who are undocumented in the States have been there for more than 10 years. They're not crossing anymore, and they're not crossing, but it's, and they're not even returning. But what was funny is the Mexicans will pay for it. Now, you can say the 2K agreement is exactly what Trump said, right? <laughs> it's Theresa May, well, of course she was not in, in charge at the time, but Theresa May saying, we're going to build a wall and the French will pay for it. And by and large, that's true. <laughs> so, if you have a, you know, an answer to this uh, puzzle, why in fact Trump's dream has come true in uh, Theresa May's uh, era in the UK, I'll be happy to hear your thoughts. Thanks very much, Virginie. That's an interesting note to end Trump's dream. <laughs> I don't know if you want this to uh, go public. Um, that Trump's dream actually come through <laughs> somewhere else. But, um, I mean, you, you both made a very strong case that um, status, status quo probably will prevail because there are very strong interests and forces at work to make that border uh, function. Um, Virginia, you, you emphasize this with more um, uh, emphasis with more uh, urgency the, the economic aspect of it but you still focus as, as Tim did in terms of people movement and con controlling people um, I wonder if you want to say something about the fact that um, Euro tunnel also carries other things than people and it's roughly a quarter of the entire trade relationship of the UK and France a uh, quarter of the European trade and um, Tim, you quoted, I think it was Alain Juppé saying that Eurotunnel must continue to function. Yeah. Uh, partly what they have in mind is actually not Eurostar at all, that's a small part of the story, but that 100 million uh, pound trade link that they have. In fact, if the UK is going to have any relationship to European common market at all, which it must, uh, after uh, mm -hmm. Brexit, mm -hmm. Eurotunnel is probably the most significant link mm -hmm. to maintain. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you want to um, reflect on that. I'll, I'll, I'll say something about it first. I mean, this comes back to the point that I was making about the, the pressure from industry mm -hmm. on, on Theresa May. Um, because at the moment, you have the infrastructure to uh, search the lorries for people uh, in Cali. Okay, so that's where it's all done. That you know the the, the X-ray, whatever the clever machines that they use, the sort of the uh, carbon dioxide detectors that they have to check whether people are in them. That's all there. But to construct them uh, in Dover would be extremely um, expensive as far as industry is concerned, and it would further delay things. Um, you know, to do that. And you've actually had the Road Haulage Association in the UK calculate. It's one of these fantastic figures. I think I've written it down somewhere. That every minute you delay a lorry uh, costs that company three pounds twenty-one. <laughs> okay. So um, they are absolutely obsessed with the idea that you know m making a change to this 
will actually, in the end, um, because of the impact it has on, on freight, will be enormously expensive. And, and that's why you know, they're very concerned about it. They're not actually that concerned about the movement of, of people, but they're concerned about the fact that um, public concern and governmental concern about the movement of people is going to slow down freight. Uh, and therefore, uh, that's why they want the British government to, to, to maintain th the status quo. Yeah, um, I did emphasize the point, but I guess I should have been clearer that yeah, when I mean the port, I mean exactly, not just, as I said, the, the issue of the people and the people trying to, it's a minuscule, that's not why it's such a, uh, so, so, such a, so important. I would say two things. What's interesting is that uh, the kind of arguments that British industries is uh, sort of anti-Brexit uh, arguments are made were made before. They were made uh, by airline companies when airline companies had to check passports and visas. They also they made also exactly it's going to take so many more minutes to get people to the airplane. They did that again when after 9/11 uh, for uh, also you know post uh, sort of anti-terrorist airline measures. Uh, the industry is split though because there are always those who come up with an idea, the security companies, the security industry says no, 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 no problem, we'll handle it. What we know for sure, because I've, I'm, although I, I do like to work on people, I also sometimes work on containers, uh, uh, when I do, since I work on movements, uh, after 9-11 the idea was to check every single container arriving in the port of New York. This never happened. So that's another thing. <laughs> this was like, it was not possible, so they just said that, but this was never implemented. Uh, but it was indeed the idea that there would be, and no technology of, in this world can actually do that. So there's a lot of bluff, I think, uh, on the security company side. But that game of numbers, of exactly how much you know, the UK will lose, is, is, is indeed a big issue. But France has a lot to do, because there are other places where, you know, to access the, the European market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, since there was a, a broad agreement with um, each other of our speakers, I'm expecting some disagreement from the floor. Just, 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 just suggestion. I, any questions? Is everyone convinced, Rupert? Um, I mean, I'm just surprised we don't see more. Uh, <coughs> We touched sort of on the issues, but I'm surprised we don't see more people trying to just um, come over on ships. Is it simply because the channel's such a busy lane that anyone who tries that gets caught almost instantly? There are a few isolated cases. Yeah. Actually, before you start, can I suggest we take just about three okay. questions so giving people a chance? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. I've got a question about this kind of relationship between France and England. And it seems to, as you say, be a kind of um, a ripple effect around Europe so that the border between England and France is one that is heavily secured in France. Likewise, between France and, and Italy, or between uh, Macedonia and Wherever. So I just was curious about uh, one mention that you, you had in, in an essay where you talked about the construction of um, the way that these kind of borders and the way that uh, refugees or migrants are, um, are regulated is based off of something that you, you say is, is trust, the, 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 the kind of buzzword of, um, of the Dublin Agreement was trust, and it seems to be still, likewise, the same, um, the same principle at play, it seems, between the border between France and, and England. Yeah. So I was just curious if you could say a few more words about that kind of agreement, because it seems to be one of a tacit agreement and not, not a, a, a kind of full-blown official agreement. Thanks, Jordan. And there's another question just behind Jordan. Yeah, this is a little bit of a stupid question because I'm not an international relations student. Um, but, I, 
But I've, uh, yeah, I've got one question, again, this might sound stupid, but if something happens, if some kind of crime were to take place mm. on the British territory yeah. within France, yeah. or for instance, if something were to happen on a Eurostar yeah. after, um, after the train leaves Gare du Nord, but it's still on France, but technically whoever has committed the crime is now within British territory, does that mean that that person gets prosecuted by the British government? And what are the kind of moral grey areas regarding that? Well, that's an interesting one, because I, I suppose I was slightly misleading in the sense that although you, uh, I, Virginia can correct me if I'm wrong, although you go through border checks, you are still actually technically yeah. on French territory yeah. um, for those legal purposes. So if a crime were committed, you would still be prosecuted by the French authorities yeah, and it would be the police who, who yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's that I think is fairly... The, the other thing that is interesting about all this, and it actually relates to the question that Ingen asked before, um, although pe people go through border checks with these juxtaposed controls, the customs checks are, can still be carried out in Dover. So, for example, if you drive over, yeah, um, you're you're checked for your your papers as as people in in Calais, but your car could still be searched in Dover um, by the customs authorities. Likewise, so there are there is a sort of anomaly. It's not 100% complete in in, mm. in that sense. So there's a, there's a an odd an odd thing going. Uh, on there. I'm going to leave some of the other questions to, to Virginie actually. The, the first one, um, oh, I've written it down and I can't read my writing. What was the first one? Why? 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 Yeah, um, well, I mean, it's, I think you, you put your finger on it. It's actually quite difficult to do in such a controlled um, small uh, channel. Um, but it does also then raise the possibility that when, you know, Marine Le Pen or or French government ministers say, well, if we were to, if we were to move the border back, we would have loads of people trying to cross, you know, on boats, etc. Et well, they could probably do that now anyway if they were determined to do it Ill illegally and get into Britain illegally. Um, I mean, I, I it, it's not really evident to me that if you were to try and um, row across the Channel in a, you know, unreliable dinghy, that you would do it in order to get to the border control facility at Dover. <laughs> Presumably, you know, as you suggest, you would do it and try and turn up in some little cove somewhere on the Dorset coast or, or Sussex on the beach or something like that. So I don't really get the argument that, that moving the border back to, to Dover would increase that, the chances of that, of that happening. If it's not happening now, I suggest there are other reasons for it not happening. It's not the fact that the border's in Calais that stops it. So I think you put your finger on something quite important. I love the question about the boats because uh, I am a sailor as opposed to an international relations theorist. <laughs> um, and every time we sail to the UK or even to the um, to the islands of the coast of France, we were always bothered by the customs. Even after having sailed for 30 hours, they knock on your door and they search for our potatoes and, and <laughs> as if we were hiding drugs or something. So they are actually border controls, I see. But. Yeah. Um, of course, in the title, there is the word border, and I think that ends, it's to get to this question about committing a crime on the Eurostar. Um, what's interesting, in, especially in the post Schengen era, which is an era which is now 30 years old, but um, the border is not a line in the same way that mm. it's, it's, it's usually, there are two things. A, it's a zone. So Schengen border is 20 kilometers ahead of the border, 20 kilometers on each side. So it's a 40 kilometer border. It's a zone. Hence the, the possibility also of, of having customs check, uh, although you think, well, I'm in France now. You know, I've brought all these cigarettes from Spain, now I'm OK. Well, no, you can still be arrested by customs. Um, there's actually, right now, being discussed, and France is in favor, um, an extension of Schengen to just imagine if every single point of entry in France has applies this. Most, they want to apply to all French cities. But already, if you are in a YC, we are in Paris, we are in the Schengen border zone. 
because we are at well, it's 36 kilometers. They want to extend this, meaning don't think of it as a line. Any place that's a port of entry, airports, etc., then you have this zone idea. But mostly, it's actually, indeed, you have sort of points along the lines where everybody gathers, like Calais, like Dover, like uh, London Heathrow, like you know, that's where people don't, you know, you could say, why don't people cross the, you know, it's no longer the kind of romantic view of, uh, I don't know, people fleeing Nazism and going over the Alps with a, or going over the Pyrenees and escaping Frank and Franco. Actually, that's not really the way it happens. People do try to go through the borders, including with tourist visa they seem to overstay, including with fake papers, etc. But there are actually quite a few people trying to get to England on these and, and, and boats. But I think it's more the way we have to think of it as um, the border is not a line. So you're on your star, you are both in England and not in England. Mm -hmm. And that also goes to the, so indeed, that's also why you have checks in Lille. I worked in Lille for 10 years, and I, every time I stepped out of the Eurostar from Brussels, I was asked for my passport and ID. And every time I said, I don't know why you're asking me, I don't understand, it's Schengen. They didn't want to tell me it was the 2K. They didn't want to tell me that they check, you know, they want to make sure that someone doesn't hop off at, you know. Because there was a loophole, time. wasn't there? There was this famous Lille loophole that they might wanted allow to people stop. to do it. Yeah. They mm. wanted to stop stopping in Lille. And of course, our mayor, the daughter of Jacques Delors, uh, Martine Aubry, was very unhappy about that. So, uh, but you're in the Eurostar. You're actually still in France for some purposes. And back to the complicated situation of the UK. I said the UK is not in Schengen. But they do participate in many of the other cooperation in the mm -hmm. areas of justice and police, mm -hmm. including the Europe arrest warrant. They, of course, cooperate with Europol. So the UK is in and out. Mm -hmm. That's also why it's so complicated for academics like me to understand Brexit. It's because, well, why people, you know, it's easy to understand. But at the same time, you can tell them, but you, you had your cake and you were in the kind of policies that you wanted, anti-terrorism, uh, anti-criminality, the UK is completely part of it. So it's not as if, you know, there was the, the fact of leaving the EU is, not, is going to make that any better. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were not in Schengen. So it's a border, is it a customs border, is it for people's movements? The UK was in a very, very strange situation, but mm -hmm. to their advantage in mm -hmm. some sense. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see how going out of the EU was somehow Make it uh, better. Um, shall we take another round of uh, questions? Yes, there is one there. Yeah. Um, so my question is a little bit more broad, um, and it goes back to your article. Um, I was sort of wondering so how is the concept of imposing visas and passports on asylum seekers something that's not considered more of like a human rights violation? I know you spoke about how. UNHCR criticized it, but is that as far as it went? And then also, the other part of my question was, um, are experts in the field of migration kind of consulted when these policies of, um, you know, migration happen, come up, you know, in the 1990s? Is there any experts that are kind of like, oh, that might not be the best idea, that might not work that well? I can quickly respond to that. Um, but let me just take a couple so more, yeah. Yes. Um, I, I don't really understand why people think that if you put the customs for the transport, the, the freight people, in Britain, it would make a difference to the time. Does that mean you would take it out of France or you would leave it in France and at Britain as well? Is it a double thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't really yeah, yeah, yeah. understand yes. what, the, what yeah. the implication was. Technicality of that. Yeah. Any other questions? I've got one actually for vision here, yeah, sure. <laughs> which is um, when the um, politicians that you know I quoted talk about um, you know, doing something about the two K or, or you know, um, revising it or scrapping it or whatever, um, is there any sense in which they truly believe that uh, and, uh, and that should happen, or is it just that they're you know they're responding to public opinion, and you know this is something they feel they should say. They're you know they're 
they're gaining notoriety and publicity by saying it, uh, or also say, do they actually believe it? I hope I can answer that question. Uh, Do you want, I'll, I'll, I'll answer one of them while you're... Yeah, sure. Uh, in terms <laughs> of the, the one about, do academics make a, make a, a contribution? Well, in vision you can say something about this. But in Britain, there is something called the Migration Advisory um, Committee um, that actually does contain experts, and the government is supposed to consult it and uh, can charge it with doing investigations uh, and reports in particular uh, areas. Um, but what you tend to find is that the government don't ask it to do things uh, that might uh, come up with um, stuff that the government doesn't want to hear. So for example, um, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about the fact that students are included in the uh, government's migration target in, in, in the UK. Uh, and this is actually very controversial, but the government has never asked the Migration Advisory Committee to look at that question in particular, okay? Because to do so would probably reveal all sorts of things that it doesn't want to hear. It would hear that the Migration Advisory Committee recommends that they're not included in the, in the target. It doesn't want to hear that. It doesn't have to take its, its, uh, its recommendations on board, but if it thinks it's gonna come up with recommendations it doesn't want, it doesn't ask. So, you know, there's a, there's a problem there. In terms of your question, I think it is this sort of double question. I think what they're worried is that it would just add another layer. In other words, it, it, they, they think that it will, it will occur in, in Dover and they will have to pay the costs. At the moment, they're effectively sort of contracted out, really, uh, into France. But if all the infrastructure has to come back, okay, they're worried that the, the delay will occur on that side and that will end up costing them. Uh, they, they, and, and possibly, I think they think that the, the, the checks will also occur on the other side as well, so it will just sort of double the trouble. In other words, that's the, that's the issue. But you, you have got a point because I mean, I, I think as well, well, would it really delay it that long? Um, I think their, their point is that you know, it will be the infrastructure that was involved and the, and the, 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 the parking up literally that would, that would be involved that would cost them. But I would like to see how they calculate that three pounds twenty one. Sorry. So on the research policy nexus, so the relationship between research and policy making, we have an excellent colleague called Christina Boswell, a professor in Edinburgh, who's done a lot of work on that. Actually, there are different cultures, meaning. You cannot, you know, the UK is not France, it's not the EU. Uh, there are many cases where indeed. Uh, case number one, policymakers want to know it all, order a lot of research, don't care about it. That would be the Netherlands probably or some place like that. Uh, case number two, France, they never ask anything from any academics. Maybe a few intellectuels will go and dine, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, you know, uh, so, of course, it makes no, no difference. Uh, the UK would be a middle case, where indeed, you know, there's, there is, uh, there are official advisory boards. Uh, there, uh, we were talking earlier, when you do research, it's supposed to have policy impact or, or societal impact. Uh, but in the end, it's not because you ask for research uh, the, to be done that you will take, uh, take in the advice. There is still a situation, that, though, uh, which Tim mentioned, which is very important, is, there is still the idea that in the area of border control, of immigration flows, very specifically, where statistics remain entirely, uh, uh, basically, national governments giving statistics to Eurostat or to the UN, uh, there is very little, uh, they have not been forthcoming even harmonizing, telling how they calculate uh, you know, the numbers, uh, you know, when, when Frontex says so many people were apprehended or so many people would cross the sea, we don't know where these numbers. So in that particular area, there's also the, the willingness, of course, of not being forthcoming with information on, on the price of the authorities. And on the other hand, sometimes it's true that there are things they don't want to know. Uh, and that could be, by the way, a very cross cleavage, left right uh, uh, issue. Do you want to know if migrants actually are a burden on the welfare state? Well, depending on where you stand. Maybe you want to know, maybe you don't want to know, maybe 
you'll be unhappy with the answer unless you are sure that the social scientists will tell you exactly what you want. But if you want independent research, it's not going to happen. When Schengen is signed, uh, and so along with it, this notion of visas and care extensions, nowhere in the agreement does it mention the word asylum, refugee. There is not one word about that. Because there is the Geneva Convention, etc., etc., Article 3 of the European Convention. So they say it's to fight irregular migration. But everybody who, know, who is in the site knows about asylum, knows that the first people who are going to be confronted with having difficulty getting a visa or even a passport will be you know, oppressed political minorities. You know. So you're a Kurd, you're going to go to Istanbul and say, you know, go, you're going to, uh, sorry to give a Turkish example, but you know, you're a Kurdish uh, and you're going to arrive at the airport and say, sorry, I have no passport or visa, but please fly me to Munich, that would be nice. And you're going to get on the airplane, knowing that the people working for the airline anyway are not going to be Kurds. So what the UNHCR was saying is that although it says this is about irregular migration, the people most likely to be actually affected are asylum seekers. But it doesn't say, it's, you know, it doesn't say anywhere in the policy that it's because there was a concern at the time that there were more asylum seekers than necessary, whatever than wanted. And this, were, this was in the mid 80s, remember, when the uh, Schengen. So already then they were concerned about asylum seekers coming from Africa, coming from, you know, we were not just a few people, let's say, going across the, the Iron uh, Curtain. Um, so it's an interesting thing. The policy doesn't say exactly what its real target is, and that mm. happens all the time, by the way. Mm. Uh, but that's what the, the, the NGOs and the UNHCR were, were getting at, and they were right. I mean, they were right in saying that, indeed, uh, you have asylum seekers who do pay criminal networks, and then they arrive and they get a refugee status. You're Syrian, you're going to become a refugee in, in Germany, but you still will have paid thousands and thousands of euros uh, to uh, traffickers, precisely because there's no legal route for you to get where you want to go. Mm. Oh, Macron. Oh, Macron has no, does not really care about this issue. That's one thing. I think he's not, well, it's, I don't know, he cannot do everything, poor thing. I'm sure he has, an, uh, I don't think that's one of the, I and mean, it's so far, um, there's a, I actually wrote in uh, Liberation, a Liberation, a Tribune, whatever, an op-ed about this. He's the knight, it's a good cop, bad cop thing, so he says, I'm going to be like Angela Merkel, I'm going to open up and I want refugees, and then his home secretary says, no way, we're going to be extremely strict. Uh, so one speaks to the European media and the Financial Times, and the other speaks to the local newspapers and, and domestic electorates. I'll send you it in French, but I'll still send you the, mm -hmm. uh, the op-ed. What I think, when I, I do think that over time, people start believing in things that they've been saying for 20 years. So originally, maybe it's instrumental to have an argument, like if there is no border in Calais, you know, uh, or if there is a camp in Calais, people will come, etc. After having repeated Generations after generation, the same argument, I think they begin to believe it. But because there is also uh, probably no credible alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes back precisely to who they listen to. If they listen, not just not people like me, but economists, back to business interests, uh, other types of, uh, maybe they would change their mind. But I think it's become, that's what I mean by a ma mantra. It's not this. You even forget the rationale of the original argument. They just keep repeating, you know, <coughs> repeating it. So I think by now they they, they believe it. Mm. Um, right. So if you really go to the frontline officers, the people who are actually at the border, uh, um, the people who were, for instance, at the Italian-French border, they know what the you know they know exactly how it works, and and they would debunk a lot of these uh, of these arguments. Mm. Mm. To what extent are they willing to come out to the hierarchy and say that you know a lot of these presuppositions actually don't work? Uh, mm. So I would really differentiate these mid-level bureaucrats, top bureaucrats, and these I think, default mind ones. Thank you. Um, 
Are there any other questions? If there are no, uh, Rupert. Um, I did want to bring up a point about something uh, that uh, Tim Bale said just now. Um, so you said there's a very, the academic literature is that there's no, um, that foreign workers don't suppress wages. Yeah. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of arguments about um, uh, businesses sourcing foreign workers because they're less likely to be in unions. Mm. Mm. And so I'd say that there are certainly some arguments to be made around that, even if the net, even if net, they don't necessarily yeah. suppress wages in specific examples that could be shown to you. Yeah, I, I think you do make a very good point there. I mean, there is evidence to suggest that some very unscrupulous employers uh, do use, um, you know, uh, irregular uh, migrants, uh, and in, in some cases regular uh, migrants, um, uh, and, and pay them very low wages and make them work longer hours than, than, than is the case, or should be the case, in terms of uh, regulation. Um, but as you say, it nevertheless, is true that it, in in the main, um, you know, there isn't any evidence. Well, apart from those cases, there isn't any evidence in the main that this actually um, you know, either takes away jobs or, um, or or suppresses wages. Even though one would assume that it must, okay, but it doesn't go on enough actually to have you know the the, the broader effect that a government will be looking to make policy on, and yet. You know, the government still, well, not not so much still, the government, um, but certainly certainly the opposition at the moment um, still makes that that argument. Um, so I mean, I, I I do take your point. You know, I'm not trying to argue that everything is fantastic and that employers don't exploit people because they do exploit people. But I, I don't think it goes on uh, enough. It shouldn't go on at all. But I don't think it goes on enough to actually have that effect you know, uh, uh, across the across the board. Um, it's not a good thing, but it, it, it doesn't. And of course, the, the you know the, the, the counter argument to that is is the um, the fact that you know um, there is no lump of labour. You know, the, the the more people who come, the more economic activity there is, the more jobs are created, etc., etc. Et and I don't think you have to be a kind of neoliberal um, to believe that that is the case. Although maybe some people in the audience think you do. So. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Can I just yeah. jump up? Well, two things. Uh, one, we have, uh, one of the theories of migration is called dual labor market theory, and it was mostly devised by uh, Michael Pure, he was a political economist at MIT. Uh, mm -hmm. And he did suggest that uh, in industrial societies, and I know it's now post industrial and the services economy would probably may apply, the point of having low paid migrants is that they accept to be at the bottom of the status ladder. So it's not even a question of wage. It's the idea that they will have the worst job that no one wants to take. So anything above that in terms of status, not just wages, you know, you will not be the one at the bottom of the pile. And he makes, you know, and, and he actually was the comparative work in Europe you know, to sort of make that point. It's not a question of wage depression so much as saying, you know, there's going to be the one who is scrubbing the floor, and, and I'm the French person, and I'm not the one scrubbing the floor, just saying how to scrub the floor. And that makes my social status, so it's a Weberian idea of class, not a Marxist idea of class. Mm -hmm. That's for the dual market labor theory, which has been criticized, etc. but uh, that's kind of interesting. But mostly, I know the literature from the US, because in the US, they've had a lot of economists look into this issue. Uh, uh, doing either experimental case studies, for instance, what happens when you have all of a sudden <coughs> the minor vote lift, and all of a sudden in one month, a few months, people arriving in Miami who are migrants, does it affect the labor market, wages, etc., etc.? They found David Card is the author. They found no effect. What they know from other studies, which are more and you know, wider studies, is that the first people lose their jobs when they are migrants are migrants and blacks of course, in the States. So the, 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 the ones that are competing with migrants are the ones that, the migrants who just, just came before, or in the case where there's a racial divide like in the States, also uh, you know, basically young, uneducated black males. Mm -hmm. uh, they will be competing, you know, who are indeed, so it doesn't affect the natives, if I can use that word. It does not affect the citizens, 
the ones who are most in trouble when new migrants, uh, there's a new wave of migrants or new migrants, are those who have just come before them, or racial, you know, racialized minorities. So it's kind of a, so it goes to what Tim was saying, but in the US we've had, I think, much more uh, studies mm -hmm. from economists in France and in Europe in general, economics, professors don't think my which is such an mm -hmm. interesting idea, mm -hmm. an issue for some mm -hmm. Yes, and that will be, I think, the last question we will take. I just wanted to know, you've spoken a lot, you've both spoken a lot about the bilateral nature of the, the negotiation that's ongoing. But do you think this could become a bargaining chip in the wider Brexit mm. negotiations? And would that change the outcome? Mm. Right. Well, I mean, for me, I, I mean, Beatrice might, might have another uh, opinion on this. I think you know, she knows more about the EU than I do, I should say. Um, she knows more about all sorts of things than I do, but uh, uh, you, you in particular. Um, I, I think my point is that it won't, actually, and that, I mean, I, I will, cards on the table, I'm not a big fan of Brexit, um, but I, I don't think that Brexit will, will change this. I, I think that this is a, a, you know, a bilateral um, agreement based broadly, although I take the ideational point seriously, on, on kind of a, a fairly rational appreciation of interests on both sides uh, and that they're not going to let the fact that the, the UK has decided to take back control and, and, and leave the European Union affect that particular arrangement. But, you know, uh, I'll take it the other view, take it from Michel Barnier's point of view. Um, it's already complicated by trying to have a con we're talking about container as well. Containment strategy, like already just talking about free movement. And just that is such a complicated <coughs> issue without, you know, it's, it's uh, international relations has all sorts of theories of negotiation and wind sets and whatnot. Uh, but in that particular case, it seems a little bit complex because already you have the bargaining chip on free movement, for instance. You have UK citizens down in mainland. I keep going to mainland Europe, I don't know, continental Europe, whatever you want to call it, uh, and vice versa. Why would you bring on top of that bilateral agreements like the Turkey? I mean, it's, it's messy on that, but also there are bargaining chips on that in the, you know, just mm -hmm. that budget mm -hmm. thing that I'm not sure, and Barnier is a good, by the way, is, I think a fairly experimented, uh, uh, astute politician. The bringing in more issues this tit for tat thing, I think at that point it doesn't really uh, make much sense. And already on this, in particular since on the table is the budget, uh, the Irish border and free movement. Uh, just on the issue of free movement, there's already so many issues on what kind of rights, uh, residence permits, etc., etc. You know, it's already the Barnier can say, okay, fine, all these UK people could go home. It doesn't need to invoke on top of that Calais or, or whatnot. It's in the background, but I don't think it's on the negotiating table. On that note, I'd like to bring this uh, discussion to a close. Uh, just before I do that, uh, I'd like to invite you all for some drinks. When we open the uh, walls behind you, oh, wow. you're going to see that we are hiding some drinks there. And But before we do that, please join me thanking our speakers uh, for this excellent discussion, great um, presentations, and I certainly have learned great deal uh, this afternoon and, and, and this evening. So let's thank our uh, speakers.